everyone in? I hope. Hello there. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And let's, I'll, I will start with, in, as we'll do a few introductions. Um, thanks for coming to this event, which is, of course, welcome to and exploring the health professions. What is pre med? Are the people who we, uh, are our presenters for today, we have a few moments. And this is an alphabetical order with Professor Andrew Flesher, who is a professor in literature and he is in ethics. He straddles the worlds of medicine and healthcare. He is, a, he is I think, the only humanitarian, the only English professor in New York State and perhaps the entire country who is listed as an essential employee at a medical school. He's on an organ donation board. He is also on the academic judiciary committee. He teaches with passion over here. He teaches undergraduates. He teaches um, graduate students. So he does a lot of stuff. You can look for his, uh, his publications, his books. He's a big fan of Jamesian, Jamesian overbelief. Okay, I'm the guy talking to you right now, James Montren, not very important. Uh, Christian Rodriguez, I don't know if he's here, but he will hopefully be here. He's a med student and this is the first day of classes and classes end at 4 p.m. So hopefully I'll be here. And then also we have Katie Zeitz, who I like to introduce, I like to say is the future Dean of Admissions at Stony Brook Medical School. She's an undergrad. She earned her graduate degree here. She has extensive experience working with med school admissions and pre-meds. And once again, she is the only person at this university in the entire state and perhaps the entire country to have received an employee of the century award. And she did that at the beginning of this century. She is a model of excellence. And I think you will find that people like Professor Flesher, Katie, and other individuals um, here at Stony Brook, if you were to come here, would make your time wonderful. If you go someplace else, try to find someone. And I hope Christian shows up soon. So oh, one thing I want to say about Professor Flesher is that he, in, according, in, in the eyes of the OED, he ranks above Shakespeare. There we go. You see, Andrew Flesher is right above Tom Shakespeare at the London School of Hygiene. Okay, so um, I think in a, in a lot of ways, I like you better than, than William Shakespeare too, but I just felt compelled to put that in. My apologies. Okay, so now the question is pre-med. Why would anyone go into pre-med or pre-health? And this, we're getting, we're getting close to end to Professor Flesher territory. Why? Because you like science, you love helping people, it's a good career, perhaps it's prestigious, not just for you, maybe you want to make your mother and father and your grandparents happy, and in a world that needs changing, it's a way to change the world. And I am tempted right now to turn it over to Professor Flesher, because Professor Flesher is from a medical family, and his sister is an eminent researcher, so I wonder if you could talk to students about the importance of what they're going to do in college, the importance of getting into medicine and also of being a humanist, being more than just sciences. Sure. sure. Yes. Thank you for, for that introduction, James. It was beyond gracious and uh, it only stands the reason that I will use a superlative or two with regard to you. Um, you've got one of the most robust and day-making senses of humor, <laughs> of which I'm aware. Uh, James and I have become friends over the last year, and um, he is a remedy for any bad day that you're having. He will bring your spirits up, and he's perfect in this role um, because he's an ambassador uh, of what's important. Um, you know, I feel inclined just to mention that as you go from high school to college, uh, you know, keep your lanes open, luxuriate in the four years that you have ahead of you and figure out where you land. Um, with those bullet points that we just saw, you've already got a good case underway for why you might want to go into the health professions. But maybe I could supplement that good advice by saying that a great way to do that is to uh, take a good liberal arts track in college 
while having that um, pragmatic goal at the end. Uh, a little background about me, um, my PhD is in comparative religious ethics. I got my PhD in 2000. I went to Duke University before that, uh, where I was a uh, major in medieval Renaissance studies and history. My PhD is from Brown in religious studies with a, a specialty in comparative religious ethics. Uh, and now I am at Stony Brook, both as a professor in family population preventive medicine um, in the program in public health and as a professor of English, two separate appointments. And the way that I see the humanities fitting so nicely with the health sciences is that the humanities offer you uh, an organic opportunity to do two things that are absolutely crucial in addition to being engaging with regard to the health sciences. Number one, they teach you how to take the insider's perspective of the other person. Uh, everybody who is suffering from an illness is going through their own idiosyncratic experience and through reading fiction for imagining what it would be like for you to be the protagonist in this person or that person's shoes is a perfect segue into putting yourself into a hospital room where everybody has their story that is not like any other story that you'll encounter. All that you know for sure universally is that in a hospital or in a healthcare setting, you know, everybody is laboring under the handicap of having to deal with what's probably bad news. Um, and you're part of the solution. It helps if you're part of the solution to be able to imagine what it's like to be that person or that person's family. And that's what the humanities does. The second thing that I can say to recommend the humanities as a nice foray into the health sciences is that if humanities puts in front of you scenarios through indirect communication, so when you read a novel or a piece of fiction or see a film or engage in any of the other kinds of literature, you are vicariously um, becoming part of a story and you're being introduced to what I like to term are non-no-brainer non issues. The humanities, in other words, fosters critical thought. There are lots of intelligent people who may have um, a difference of opinion as to what route to follow to resolve a certain situation. So that kind of imagination and, and intelligence behind different ways of thinking about problems are critical for not just the opportunity to get into medical schools where ethics questions have become a huge part of the MCATs now, but also to actually do the job um, where, you'll, where you'll be put in real life scenarios where there's more than one way to go. Um, social histories are a very important part of becoming a clinician, whether you're a nurse or um, a physician or any whole host of other kinds of people involved in, in the rendering of healthcare. And the last thing I'll say about how I personally connect the humanities and the health sciences, and this comes through in everything I've published. I've published four books, um, which have both been in you know, the humanities per se, uh, and also the health sciences, is that I look at the question of how our individual liberties fare against um, the burden of having to protect a population, whether it's population health or whether it's policies that will represent um, those who are you know, not people normally in positions of power, minorities, and so forth. So you know, that's a counterintuitive thing. The idea that you would have a vaccination policy, for example, that might impinge upon presumptions about the inviolability of bodily integrity, while at the same time, through its mandate, protecting a whole population. One of the things that I do is try to look at those edges and see where um, a public policy, a policy that's truly apropos to the public square, um, should encroach upon our individual liberties and where individual liberties have to hold the line. Again, intelligent people will have different answers to those questions. So, you know, I, I want to, by way of introduction, just have you have an opportunity to overcome the myth that if you are going into college and you want to go to medical school or you want to pursue a profession in public health or one of the many other avenues for the health sciences, that this then precludes you from a proper uh, liberal arts education. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth, both in terms of admissions and in terms of the relevance and, and frankly, the fun of your education um, en route to that you know, worthwhile professional ambition. 
you have four years in college for you know you're learning to be about you again i want to use this verb luxuriate in those four years it's the only time of your life um, where you'll be allowed to not be nickel to death dying to death with regard to the limited amount of time that you have um, so that's a little bit of an introduction welcome to the best part of your life that's about to uh, come even during the era of COVID. and I'm here to answer questions um, if we like, but maybe we want to introduce Katie and others and answer questions I've left. I don't know. I'll turn it back to you, James. Okay, with, with Katie, of course, one thing that Professor Flesher talked about is you can major in just about in just about anything. Um, and to get back to uh, to your studying in college, of course, uh, one thing about Katie, who's now in career services where she can give you advice. Well, she studied at Stony Brook as an undergrad and she's much closer to the undergraduate experience than either Professor Flesher or me. So um, I think things to know about going into college and being a pre-med, one is of course to manage your studies well. And another thing is that you can pick just about whatever major. And I don't know if Katie, if you'd like to say something about your experience as an undergraduate at Stony Brook and just in general, as an undergrad in college, what do you think are the keys for success that a student needs to know before Absolutely. we get into the nitty gritty pre-med stuff? Great. So first of all, also, Jim, thank you so much for that introduction. That was a very <laughs> spectacular and very, uh, you know, thank you for, uh, for that. Um, and thank you for having me here today. So talking a little bit about my experience as an undergrad, number one was, you know, we all come into college thinking we have some idea, but also it's okay to feel like you have absolutely no idea, um, you know, especially coming into Stony Brook. Stony Brook is a large institution, so exploring and also, you know, in a healthy way to do that, especially with the pandemic, figuring out what can you balance with your time, thinking about how much, you know, you can take on without spreading yourself too thin. So I work in the career center. I'm the career coach for healthcare, and I help students find experiential opportunities. So that can include internships, that can include research opportunities, as well as part-time jobs, community service, volunteer opportunities as well. So one of the things at college is that you're going to want to experience what don't you like and what what do you like? And especially when it comes to the healthcare professions, you want to be able to say, all right, where can I maximize my four years and how much can I do while balancing a healthy uh, style of living, whether you're balancing your academics as well as your experiential opportunities. Um, so when it comes to, you know, career services, we help students also articulate some of the skills that they're bringing in. Medical schools want to be able to ask you, so how have you built your interpersonal competencies? And that can be through, of course, your academics within your classroom, within your class projects, but also then your interpersonal competencies may be through a part-time job. So even positions like sales associates or cashier positions, those are very, very important to also maintain because those are where you're getting your customer service skills. You're learning how to communicate effectively. You're learning how to be a leader. And that's exactly how you're going to portray that on your applications when you apply to medical school. So at the Career Center, we help students articulate those ideas. What skills do they have to offer medical schools? And um, you know, how, what, how'd you hone them during undergraduate? So at Stony Brook, you know, again, it was a very large institution and you, know, you could feel a little overwhelmed, but also it's the mentorship that finding professors like Professor, uh, you know, uh, Fletcher is, is amazing to be able to maximize your time, get to know your TAs in the class too, because that's how you're going to utilize that. And I know we're going to get into that much more in today's conversation, but that's how I found to be successful at Stony Brook is by really asking for help and taking opportunities, you know, whenever they came to my plate. Yep. Okay. So that's good. And of course, one thing with mentorship, so, you know, with, what you want to do, regardless of where you go, is to keep in mind people like Katie. And so all the, uh, you'll find a lot of people at Stony Brook and perhaps at other schools, but of course I know Stony Brook better, have, have, uh, have some grasp upon here admissions to medical school or dental school, other health professions, PTPA. So Katie, I think, knows a lot more about getting into med school than many a professor. One exception to that, I think, would be Professor Flesher. And also Professor Flesher, he knows about healthcare, medicine, life and death decisions. 
He's networked with people at the medical school. One of uh, with humanities, of course, people are wondering about how to balance humanities and your studies. Uh, one of Professor Flesch's colleagues and uh, beloved uh, friends or mentors is uh, Dr. Jack Coulihan, who's a physician and published poet. So certainly you can do, you can do both. And when you think of going into healthcare, this is dentistry, medicine, optometry, podiatry, veterinary, anything in healthcare. I think it's important to remember that your interpersonal skills and your competencies are are very important. One of our dental school professors, a Dr. Barry Waldman, he says about dentists, he says, you may, you'll make more money with your mouth, meaning talking to people, than you will with your hands. So these are the things. So you like science, you have to know how you like science, love people, how do I like helping people? You want a good career, prestige, you want some reward for this, and it's, it's a way to change the world in a world that needs changing. Okay, so now let's go to the next slide. Uh, so what about Stony Brook pluses about Stony Brook? Okay, people come to Stony Brook, I think, because it's strong in science. We have pre-med courses. And of course, strong in science, we have a good chem department, physics, mathematics. Our anthro is very strong, too. We have a study abroad program in Madagascar. Pat Professor Patricia Wright is world-renowned for her work on lemurs. Um, we have pre-med courses. There are um, pre-dental courses. There's this block of courses you'll see that you need to take to get into medical school and dental school. We have research. This is very good too, because medical schools and dental schools, they like people who are hands-on problem solvers, lifelong learners. Our tuition, all tuition is too expensive, but a state school tends to be more affordable than a private school. Also close by, this is very nice, we have a hospital, we have a dental school, we have a medical school, HTM, health technology and management, PA, PT, OT, nursing, respiratory care. All the programs I just mentioned, you'll need to apply to at some point. Alas, we do not have a pharmacy school. Alas, because uh, I know that's a question. And of course, all the programs we mentioned, med, dental, optometry, uh, we don't have optometry, med, dental, PT, PA, nursing, all these programs, they also will typically require an application. We have a Scholars for Med program, a Scholars for Dental program, a BSMD, a BSDDS. You need to get into that and to do well in it. It's not accelerated, but it, it offers a guarantee. Okay, one thing about here, of course, um, with people coming, to, that's why people come to Stony Brook. I like to keep in mind that some people, and I think Katie knows this, um, some people who come to Stony Brook, they don't necessarily leave, they stay. We get lucky with some people like Katie, who is still here, a, tr a Stony Brook treasure, treasurer, and also one pleasure I have, because I interview people who apply to medical school and dental school, is this, just this year, I, um, I uh, recruited to the pre-med committee a student who I wrote a letter for like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the student got into med school here, did a residency here, and now is a professor and the physician over at the medical school. So it's very nice. You know, one of the uh, long-serving physician on the med school is, is also a Stony Brook undergrad. The dean of admissions at our med school was a Stony Brook undergrad, Dr. Jack Fuhrer. The assistant dean, Grace Agnetti, she was from Stony Brook. So one thing is, Stony Brook, they do know the value of a Stony Brook um, degree of classes. It's not an unfair advantage, just they're aware of the quality of the classes here. And some students get hired back. Some people come back for residencies. So keep, keep in mind, you know, and I think of an, a session like this, and again, this maybe it's just my imagination. I do think of it in speaking to you, even though I'm looking at my PowerPoint slide and I can't see you right now. I think in a way I'm kind of recruiting someone who's going to be my boss someday. My hope, if you were to come here, if you don't want to come here, fine, but you get into Stony Brook, you get into the med school or dental school, then you'll become a professor here. Then I'm going to draft you onto the pre-med committee. That's my ideal hope. We had that once. We had a post back dental student. He got into Stony Brook's dental school. Then he became, they made him dean of admissions. It was very, very nice. Unfortunately, he left because he wanted an ideal life in the Connecticut suburb. 
I can't blame him. I feel it was selfish, but of course that's, you know, my narrow point of view, but it's a Stony Brook, it's, it's decent. Uh, what other Stony Brook in a nutshell, a variety of classes, English, there's like Professor Flesher, there's a minor in film, there's anthropology, biology, you can do any major. We have a lot of research opportunities to get research. Typically it helps to have experience, but you could do it, arm yourself with information. And this is even not at Stony Brook. There are other places you could get information. Health related experience. We have a hospital, we have an ambulance corps, a dental clinic, uh, a childcare center. There's community and leadership opportunities like the, the people in charge of the volunteer ambulance corps. They negotiate to buy ambulances and they, you know, to pass state paperwork you can get some really serious uh, achievements and responsibilities as an undergrad. I think that's important to remember. Mentoring and networking opportunities. So Katie Seitz knows people, other people in career services. She knows people at the medical school, at the dental school, at hospitals in Manhattan. Professor Flesher knows people at the medical school. He has contacts you know, throughout the country in ethics and research. This spring, he was in a way, he, he, you know, he, I was in his class sitting in, he was on the cutting edge of information about the coronavirus pandemic. So you can really um, get, uh, you know, uh, be on the cutting edge of getting a lot of information and networking. Stony Brook is fairly big, that puts some people off. Okay, classes can be difficult. It can be confusing. Uh, Go into Health Science Center where they have those round lecture halls. It's very confusing to find your way. I don't know if Professor Flesher agrees or disagrees. Stony Brook is competitive. I don't know if Katie would agree or not. She can tell me. I think it's competitive, but not cutthroat. You hear about some places being cutthroat. These are the things to keep in mind. Some people like small schools. You have to find out the, what fits for you. And also it's a question of what's going to make you happy. What can make things easier here and anywhere else? Help rooms like a math help room, a chemistry help room, TAs, study groups. There are clubs. There are programs, you know, like WISE, Women in Science and Engineering. We have advising. Try, if you come here or any place else, hook up with a mentor. Find a professor who will take an interest in you and nurture you. A lot of times you might have to find out about what they, what they teach. You know, read their paper. Read one of Professor Flesher's books. You can get it out free from interlibrary loan. Mentoring, you'll be able to find mentors and professors to visit them, to ask them questions. These are the things that regardless of where you should go, I think you want to do it. Get the most out of your college career. Step out of the crowd because medical schools and dental schools, they do. They look for people who step out of the crowd. And I, I interview a couple hundred people every year. What some people accomplish is exceedingly impressive. And Katie knows this because she's seen a ton of recommendation letters from pre-health. It, it just, it, 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 you stand back in awe at what some people endure and what some people achieve on the road to getting into medical school. It's truly inspiring. I think you might not do this, but remember it. If you can, when you get into medicine or dentistry or some health profession, get on an admissions committee <laughs> so you can read about students. And Professor Flesher, he's on the Admissions Committee for Public Health. He knows about that too. Anyone can be pre-med here. Uh, you can major in anything. Of course, there are limits about, you know, can I take a course 10 times? No. There are limits on retakes, but that's okay. Try to do it right the first time. This is pre-med here. Two semesters bio with lab, two semesters gen chem, organic chem, a semester of biochem, physics. This is around 50, 60 credits. You need to take these classes. You need two semesters of English. Not every single school is the same. For example, Stony Brook's med school now, I think they'll be happy with one semester of physics. Our dental school still demands two semesters. Even in the same university, there can be differences. So you have to be informed about this. Right now, you're, you're new, you're getting into this. I think the thing is master the basics and then fill in the details. Avoid grades below a C, take letter grades. Don't overload yourself. Don't let someone push you where you feel uncomfortable. Of course, don't be a wimp, but don't let someone push you into a disaster. Be judicious with, with withdrawals and pass fail. Here's where Professor, Professor Flesher comes in. 
avoid academic dishonesty. He teaches the course to students who have had an academic dishonesty. And I don't know if you want to say a word about academic integrity, Professor Flesher? Um, I could, but I'll let you finish your presentation and then. Okay. All right. You know, it's, there, there are a few mistakes you, that you can make from which you can't recover, but academic dishonesty is a biggie. Never let anyone, see, never give your lab report to anyone, let anybody copy it, never copy from anyone. Always cite things when you're writing papers. Make sure to do those things. The basic 10, we're getting to the end of this presentation. All right, you can do it. You can make, if you want to go into medicine or dentistry, you can achieve this. You can make it a reality. We, you, people are non-traditional. You, know, you don't get older in admissions. You get more non-traditional. The most non-traditional person I ever saw get an acceptance to medical school, and that was this year, we had a student who was born when Eisenhower was running for his second term. Okay, do the math. That's, so that's, I think that is amazing. That's, that's encouraging. That's encouraging. I'm not telling you to wait that long, but do it right. You know, make sure you want to do it. Um, decide how to achieve your goals. Be careful. Build on your foundation or think in terms of career, quality, you know, get the high quality first, then you can rush. Pick a major that you like and pick a major that likes you back. You could major in religious, something relating to religion and philosophy like Professor Flesher. You could do biochemistry, biomedical engineering we have here. We have music. We have pre-meds from all these areas. I think you should network. In a way, this meeting we're having now is the beginning of networking because you're talking to us. Maybe you'll send us an email afterwards. I'll give you my email address. Get relevant experience. I think also it's good to arm yourself with information. So if you were to reach out to Professor Flesher, maybe read one of his papers. If you will look for his colleague, Dr. Coulihan, he has a new book out, <laughs> maybe get it from interlibrary loan, read it. And um, if you're interested in a particular school, Stony Brook or NYU or something, you go to PubMed, type in Stony Brook and cancer, Stony Brook and emergency medicine, ditto at NYU, Columbia, whatever school you're thinking about and just be aware of it. Build your interpersonal skills. Don't take me as an example, but right, med schools look for competencies. Can you talk to another person? Can you listen? How do you behave? And stay out of trouble. That's an important thing. Those are the biggies. Hope mass do these things, go in mastering these things, and the world should be your oyster. And here are just some, uh, a couple things to keep in mind. I'll put this up again later. Our location right now, of course, our office is closed. My email address, our website, uh, information for MED, AAMC, ADEA, Explore Health Careers, the NIH, the Oxford English Dictionary. Know your language, use your language well. It's very important. I once had a very interesting conversation with a med school, with a, with a resident, uh, went to Tulane about what's the best term to use? Should you say a stercolith or a fecolith? An etymological puzzle for a medical scholar. So now let's put this away. And then I have a list of questions, but let's see what Professor Flesh is going to say. Well, I'll just make one more comment that I think both ties in the academic integrity piece and the presentation that you just uh, offered and my and Katie's opening remarks. Um, what you are doing in college is not pursuing an economic credential. It may instrumentally and incidentally serve that purpose, but this is something special. It's a time in your life that's something special. It is not simply something that's ends oriented, but it's about the journey and being in the moment and so, you know, one of the reasons in terms of virtue um, to do it honestly, to you know, not try to circumvent the work that your professors assign is because the, the good in question that you're pursuing becomes meaningful um, to the same extent that you succeed as if you fail. That learning so often in life in college is no ex exception, is by trial and error. And you will not just 
earn, but you will command the respect of your mentors and your professors if they see you stumble the first time and then get it right. And that's how the brain works. Stony Brook is an awesome place, okay? This is not your garden variety institution. You are just by waking up in the morning uh, and going on Zoom and very soon going back to campus, uh, and some of you already going to campus, you are going to just by living your life encounter some of the most intelligent, thoughtful, provocative, warm people you've ever met. Um, James has been very kind to me <laughs> in this presentation, but the truth is I'm not special. I'm run of the mill, I'm you know, an average resource at Stony Brook uh, who really believes in the sacred duty uh, to help you find your way. So um, one of the ways that we get to know you is to see you struggle through something, is to see your process. It's our job to be accessible. And I, I really believe this. I'm not just saying it. It's not just me who buys into that, who, who takes it seriously. But all the colleagues I've gotten to know, um, despite the fact that they're heavily invested in research and primary research, uh, we really do take seriously our charge to get to know the students. So this is simultaneously a, a more drawn out appeal to you to be honest and, and actually mean uh, that you've done the work when your name goes on that paper, but also um, an attempt to, to, to get you gleeful and enthusiastic about the roll up your sleeves experience that represents the college and journey um, that you're headed down. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over and I'm here for a bit to answer any questions, no matter what they are, whether it's something that's been mentioned or not. Um, but I, I don't know if Katie wants to say another few words or, or if you want to say anything else, James. One question that I have is, is, Dr. Flesher, how do I balance my interest in arts and humanities if I also want to have a career in medicine? So the important thing, if you want a career in medicine, and I'll turn this over to Katie as well, uh, is to know exactly what you need to do to be eligible for a career in medicine. And at that point, and no point beyond that, so just up to that point, this is my view, restrict all the rest of the courses that you want to take to the courses that you want to take. <laughs> Get to know your professors, go where your heart takes you, do what you have to do. You're going to have to take organic chemistry if you want to become a doctor. Find out from Katie what it is you have to do and be very protective of all the rest of the courses that you get to take that will feed your head and give you the opportunity to become better writers, clearer thinkers, perspective takers, critical engaged thinkers that can see more than one side to an argument. And we've been doing this a very, very long time. There is no major on earth that qualifies you more for uh, becoming a physician or someone else in the health sciences than English. Um, I could speak for five hours for why that's the case. James just, as he mentioned earlier, sat in the course that I taught for why that's the case. Katie, will, Katie and her colleagues will make sure that you're positioned to be eligible, but once you are eligible, make sure for your own sake that you're getting what you're, supposed, what you're supposed to get out of college and take all the courses, the exact courses that you want to take. Kate, Katie, do you want to supplement my Yes, answer? I do. Thank you. So also, I want to make sure that everybody knows too that, you know, yes, you have a major and you're going to be fulfilling those requirements, but you'll have the flexibility within your curriculum to also flex those areas of your application that, you know, if you have an interest, go for it. And you can kill two birds with one stone at some point because, you know, Stony Brook wants you to be able to receive a well-rounded education where you can, you know, talk about, you know, we just added the diversity uh, Stony Brook curriculum requirement where you can also learn about that, or you can also learn about, you know, different areas that your major might not provide you. So if that incorporates some of those classes that maybe like, let's say a language class, you can express that through your application and really flex that part where you can, you know, take on and have a good balance between those heavy courses like the STEM ones, and also your major ones, but also then having a well-rounded well um, exposure to those classes as well. Yeah, uh, 
our, I'm on, as James mentioned earlier, our, our public health admissions committee. So these are people pursuing an MPH, which often dovetails with people who go to medical school. I can tell you that um, our most important recruits have come from the Department of English, where I teach undergraduates. So it's, it's meaningful to me that I get to meet these undergraduates finding themselves and then I'm writing them letters of recommendation for medical school and for our program in public health. And uh, I've been on this admissions committee for a number of years. There's yet to be a student that has appealed to me in whom I, you know, in whom I believe and, and that I've come to know one of my students where if it was their ambition to get into this program, they haven't gotten it. Uh, and it's a competitive program. We turn a lot away. So um, to the person that asked that question, Talk to people like Katie, talk to Katie about what you have to do, and then do exactly what you want to do. And sometimes there's a little bit of finding your way in that process. You need this in college. Stony Brook is an insanely good deal. It is so much bang for the buck. A lot of lobster without too much lobster shell. I don't know how many metaphors I can go through here. You are so lucky to be getting an education at a place like Stony Brook where you're positioned for a career in the health sciences, but you've got brilliant liberal arts professors from whom to take, who are also situated in some of these post-college professional environments. Avail yourself of that situational advantage. Yeah, certainly I, th I think with the major, you see students, uh, there are some people where everything fits together. And we had a student once who came here, he transferred, he did an undergraduate in respiratory, he had a, an associate's in respiratory care. Then he came here and he finished up a biology major. And he was working at a sleep disorder center. And he was thinking of doing a doctorate studying sleep disorders, but he decided to go to medical school. He went to medical school and then like around six years later, seven years later, I looked for this fellow and he's down at a hospital in down in the south of the Mason Dixon line at a major hospital and he's a neurologist and he's doing what sleep disorders so there's this unity of inspiration on the other hand we had a post back once who was a drummer in a rock and roll band for 10 years before deciding to pursue medicine and he's now a pediatrician someplace we've had we had a physics uh, major who in his spare time wrote operas you get all kinds in medical school. So I think what you do is find your strengths, go for it, and the other, but the thing is, of course, you pick a major that likes you, pick a major that you like and pick a major that likes you back. Because you might like something, and what if you like studying it, but you get horrible, horrible, horrible grades in it? Then you think twice. However, even if your undergrad doesn't go well, there are, there are a few mistakes that you can't eventually recover from. I've seen people with an undergrad GPA of a 2.5 go on and then do post back work, strengthen themselves and get into medical school. If the passion is really there, you should be able to make it happen unless other responsibilities intervene. And for some per a person, we had a, po a post back once who was going for dental but he got married and he said, I don't want to put my spouse through this. You know, he, he, and he, so he went into real estate instead. We had a student once who didn't like retaking the MCAT and uh, who I referred to a clinical opportunity. And the student said, I can make more money with, in the stock market. And so then the student went into the stock market to make money. So a lot of this is life decisions. And of course that comes in also picking medicine versus dentistry. All these programs, medicine, dentistry, PT, PA, nursing, clinical laboratory sciences, respiratory care, you would have to apply to at some point. And I think you want to find out what works for you, which is also why it's nice to have a hospital close by. As an example, our former chief of colorectal surgery, this guy, Roberto Bergamaschi, he's in Westchester now. Um, one student who worked with Bergamaschi was comparing Bergamoski versus the PA, and this guy, robotic colorectal surgery, and the PA mentioned to the student and said, look, Bergamoski is working 80 hours a week. I work 40 hours a week, and I'm making, you know, a six-figure salary. 
so that the PA was quite happy having more of a life outside of the operating room and having a challenging career. This might be a reason why someone goes perhaps for PA or OT or PT instead of going to medicine. Or some, a lot of people, you know, it mounts up over the years, will say, I wanted to go to dentistry because I, I, I like being able to get results for my patient. And, you know, as opposed to dealing with a person dying of cancer. It's the aspect of the work. It's a hands-on work, analytical work. I think medicine and healthcare is broad enough where you probably you'll be able to find something fascinating if you can get into the basic sciences. Opportunities to volunteer. Yeah, there are opportunities to volunteer at the hospital right now, of course. And here's Christian Rodriguez, who I, let's him talk. Uh, this is the guy, this is a Stony Brook guy. Let me ask him to unmute. This is the ultimate source of wisdom who I hope Hi, will say hello to Professor Flesher and to Katie. Hi, how's He's it going a guys? Stony Brook student he, who is now at Stony Brook's med school who came here. I'm gonna shut up and listen to Christian. He will tell you how he did it. He's, he achieved the dream that you have. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, as you know, I have had a, a fairly non-traditional path um, getting into medicine. Um, you know, you start out pre-med, you have this idea and this plan of like, this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And then as you were alluding to before with uh, some of the people that you've encountered, sometimes life just gets in the way and things don't go as planned. You might have like a health issue, you might have a family issue, and you might have a tough semester, you might not do so hot, um, but keeping at it and really focusing on like what your priorities are and what you can do to improve your situation, get back from like a tough uh, semester, or uh, if you're at like a crossroads like I was at a, a couple years ago when I was teaching. So briefly, Graduated, uh, got a master's in uh, chemistry at Stony Brook, a bachelor's in biochem also, taught uh, science in the Bronx for a year. And I was sort of at that crossroads of like, do I want to continue this career in teaching or do I really want to take the risk and uh, achieve my dream of becoming a physician? And uh, I took that risk and fortunately got here. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like you got to be willing to take risks and be comfortable with the choices that you make because there also was a possibility of you not getting in, but um, really working towards getting to that goal, whether that be, you know, going and uh, staying at home, not going out to certain parties, not partying as much, um, saying no to certain obligations, um, losing a little bit of sleep to get some more research done. Um, it's a lot of risk you got to take, but it's worth it if the uh, path is worth it to you. So I know that was like sort of a lot and also all over the place, um, but I could be a lot more specific if anybody has any question particular about like a non-traditional path or um, academics at Stony Brook and uh, things along those lines. Actually, I, I, um, I got directed a message, Christian, I think you'd be able to um, advocate a little bit more than I can on this, but somebody yeah. asked, how would you describe the environment of your STEM classes, especially your pre-med? Because um, somebody yeah. heard that they were depressing. So can you just talk a little bit, because <laughs> I think you have a little bit more experience in terms of the STEM classes uh, at Stony Brook. I understand. Uh, yeah, sure. I'd love to speak about that. Um, I wouldn't uh, characterize them as depressing. Um, they're more so just rigorous and difficult especially as you get up into the upper division bio courses, there's a lot of, a lot of information. So like really high volumes that you got to get down and be able to apply in different contexts within like two weeks, three weeks. And it's uh, really long hours of studying. Uh, I don't think there it's, it's depressing at all. You also, as you're going down that path, you get friend groups, you start to recognize certain people, uh, similar people in the same classes, which is actually pretty beneficial at a school like Stony Brook because in the beginning you're in uh, your intro courses, your intro STEM courses with, you know, six, 700 people in a lecture course. And then as you progress through going into junior, senior year and getting into those upper division bio courses, you're in classes 
140, 150 people, which is still a lot, but significantly less than six, 700 people. And you start to see who's still there with you along this path. You have people similar interests and you're sort of struggling and, and going through this together with people. And that helps out a lot with relieving stress, uh, finding a friend group to study with and help you along the way. Um, but I, I definitely wouldn't characterize it as depressing, just more so rigorous. Christian, can I ask, what's the one thing you wish you had known at the outset of this that would have made life Ooh. so much easier way back when, when you first said, maybe I'll be a doctor? Uh, awareness of getting opportunities to find out what it's really like, opportunities to even get an experience of what it means to be a physician, what it's like to be in clinic or in the OR, uh, in the emergency department, um, getting in that your foot in the door uh, for me was, was probably the most difficult part because I remember when I really decided that I wanted to do it, I didn't know where to start. Um, I didn't go to like pre-health. I wasn't really aware of that uh, office when I first really wanted to go into it. And so actually what I did was I cold called all the physicians at my local hospital, like every single one, the directory at Huntington Hospital. I called them all, all their offices to see if I could get some shadowing because I wanted to see what it was like. None of them re responded to me, not, not one. Uh, so then I went on to find out, all right, well, if that's not a place I can start, then where can I start? And that's when you start to figure out about uh, or learn more about pre-health advising learn more about how to even become aware of opportunities to get your foot in the door and learn about this experience of what it means to be a physician. Be persistent. That's an important lesson, right? Yes, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Cause uh, you know, sometimes things go wrong. Uh, you know, it's definitely, it was very discouraging for me when I emailed all those people called all those physicians and nobody got back to me, which, you know, to be fair, some random kids calling you. Um, but it's like, it's one thing and then it could be another. And then you could really feel like it's starting to snowball. But if you're not persistent, you're not resilient, then it's easy for it to just continue to snowball. And, uh, you know, you can end up uh, on a different path. What do you think of med school interviews and, med and interviewing skills, Christian? Uh, I would highly recommend practicing. Um, being aware of like what the differences are in different kinds of med school interviews, because there's the MMI, which is becoming a lot more uh, common now. MMI is the mix, uh, multiple mini interview, which is more so situational judgment. And then there's the traditional interview, which is, you know, like one on one um, speaking with a faculty member or an upperclassman and speaking to them for 45 minutes to an hour. And the MMI stations are, you have anywhere from like, four to six stations and as I said before it's situational judgment so you go from one station to another um, and you don't really it's not really easy to to prepare for those unless you really go out to something like your pre-health advising office and you get your feet wet and figure out all right what are the kinds of questions or situations that they would want to ask me in that uh, kind of MMI format what kind of conversation would you have in a traditional format so I, I would really recommend um, doing some of those simulations to really figure out how you would react, what things you're doing right, what things you're doing wrong and revising. Because there's a ton of information out there. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot. At the uh, information sessions for admitted students, one thing I very often say at the beginning now to people is to put your cell phone on mute and refrain from, uh, from, uh, from text messaging until you have published the scientific paper and been an EMT for 2,000 hours. And um, it's a joke, but there's a certain amount of truth to it. You know, you, you really want to stay focused on the task at hand, certainly. What else? How difficult, the MCAT is difficult. Some people have a tougher time with the MCAT than others. All of these admissions tests, the most important, that was one of the questions, is, of course, practice. Take practice tests um, that explore healthcareers.org. Uh, one st uh, student said, really, and this is a guy, 
we had a, a post back once he had been in radio and he got, he decided to go into medicine because he was, he was a techie on a radio show and there was a, a, a health guru who was giving advice to a, to a, a, a a person on the other end of the phone suffering cancer who he'd never met before. And the student got so mad, he decided to become a physician. And he came here, he took classes here, he got into medical school. And then after he got into medical, you know, once he graduated from Stony Brook, he was at one of these information sessions like we're having now, but an in-person one. And, um, and he, he was going off to an Ivy League uh, residency. And he said to me, I have a quarter of a million dollars in debt. And what they're paying me at my residency can barely cover the interest. And I, I said to him, it sounds to me like what you're going into now is tougher than medical school. And he turned to me and he said, Jim, it only gets tougher. And in talking about the MCAT, he said something I thought was very wise. He said, this is a skill you need because you're going to be taking tests like this for the rest of your life. James, can I? I just want to supplement something. Please do. I got to be leaving in a second. Yeah. Um, you know, the, we have high school students here, right? Yes. So I wouldn't stress too much about the MCAT yet. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the MCAT, I think what Christian and James said is exactly right. I'd even be more intense. You want to be obsessive compulsive about it. You want to take about 50 practice tests. You want to know, you want to be able to answer permutations of the likely questions the way a circus performer does backflips at the Cirque du Soleil. You want to know that stuff cold and be obsessive about it. However, with regard to the story and the interviewing and the, and the existential decision making that leads you to become a healthcare professional, whether it's a clinician or something else, that needs to be not so much programmed or contrived. It needs to be, in my view, totally authentic. Just listening to Christian and the cold calls he made, um, you know, feed into his story and helped him check himself, is this something I really want? You will have no problem in the interview if you actually have something substantive to say, as opposed to saying what you've memorized to say. In an interview, you don't want to say anything that's been memorized. You want to actually tell someone your story and you want that story to be how your weird, idiosyncratic, thrilling life up until this point led you to do something that you could not help not do. <laughs> so there's a million justifications for wanting to be the altruistic, sacred individual in this world that helps someone else out who's suffering. There's really no better way to do this in a regular way than to become a clinician, a physician, a nurse, or somebody else dealing with a patient who's suffering. That is the best way to help out other people in a regular way that I know of. And I'm not a physician, uh, so I'm saying this on behalf of other people. But to be that sort of person who is gonna follow a life that, that requires you know, a ceaseless and ongoing sacrifice, it can't be something you memorize. So the approach to this, and I'll turn it back over to, to Christian here to see if, if he agrees or wants to supplement what I'm saying. The approach to the MCATs, you got to be ruthlessly pragmatic. Know your stuff, know your answers, talk to Katie about the courses you have to take. All the rest of it has to be your journey, and there ha it has to be a labor of love. It cannot be a contrived script. You can't be doing it for someone else that wants you to do it including, and I would say, especially your parents. It has to be for you. It's the rest of your life. And if that's the case, you are going to be doing something that is going to make it so easy for you to be in an interview because you'll have something real to say. Going to medical school or following, you know, one of the health professions is a lot like getting married. Um, if you've done the wrong thing. If it's not the right decision for you, it's an unwholesome misery that's going to plague you for the rest of your life. But if you made the right choice, that's authenticated by the decisions that you became aware of through trial and error on your idiosyncratic path, it's a richly rewarding life um, that will fulfill you until the end. So.
that's, that's the spirit with which I want to leave you. Be yourself and, and give yourself the college education that you richly deserve. And when it comes down to it about those things that Christian mentioned and that Katie will advise you on and James will advise you on, be ruthlessly pragmatic about those things, but they can't be the motivation. I agree. Um, if I could just supplement um, to what you were just alluding to about um, being a physician, I, I, I individually just, I believe the impact that physicians have is actually under, underestimated, it's understated, because you're not just helping out the person that's sick in front of you, but that person that's sick in front of you also has relationships with like their parents, their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister. So you're not just helping out that person, but you're also helping out their parents from relieving any sort of stress, any sort of uh, anxiety that's associated with you know, their loved one really getting hurt, say in like a car accident or going through something like cancer. Um, you know, you really become part of your patient's lives and the lives that, that they have with their family. And it's, uh, it's a really unique experience. There's really nothing else like it. And um, that, that is something I'd just like to supplement to what you were saying um, about that. Yeah, I just really think it's, it's under, underestimated. Yeah, I, I can't resist. What Christian just pointed out is the difference between a disease and an illness. A disease is a pathogenic condition. An illness, any ILL dash NESS, is the state of being ill. And when you're ill, your function in life to your every everything is disrupted. All those relationships. So it really is sacred work. And by the way, this is the medical humanities, just this. <laughs> it is the stuff of the medical humanities. All um, easily accessible by email. I usually respond to everyone within 24 hours. I wish you all the best going forward. I got to step off now, uh, but it was really nice to meet you and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah. Nice guy. Professor Flusher. Yeah. You never took any of his classes at Stony Brook, did you, Christian? Or Katie? No. I don't think so. No. I don't, I don't remember Professor Flusher. Yeah, I, 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 for some reason, I can't remember now. For some reason, I, I, I sat in on his class this spring, and then when we went to virtual because of COVID, I wound up helping him run it, you know, doing the, doing oh, cool. the tech stuff. It was a very interesting thing, you know, like reading When Breath Becomes Air, that, you know, maybe you've read, you know, if you, if you guys haven't read it, you know, take a look at it. It's an interesting, um, interesting book. It's the memoir of Dr. Paul Kalanithi, who, when he was a resident, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. There are a lot of different books out there. We mentioned PubMed, of course, um, just to, you know, because you guys are gonna, probably going to sign off for a minute quickly, just to show you what I mean. This it. Here we go. This is just an example, you see, so this, so you could take a look, you know, you search, okay, Stony Brook and cancer. And here are, right, these are different research papers. And of course, what happens, you know, uh, you don't know it because you haven't been here yet. But I look at these names and I think of people over there, right, this Reed, this is Inefta Reed, who teaches Bio 203 and is in charge of our uh, Master's in Physiology and Biophysics. This S.A. Khan, this is Dr. Sardar Ali Khan, who passed away shortly after Christmas last year, a long-serving veteran physician in urology. Um, you know, but okay, you can look for this. Oh, you're interested in a particular area of cancer. Dilger, that's another James Dilger, another leading light professor here. So you take a look, and then you might try to contact these people. Arm yourself with information, reach out, it won't always, as a Christian can tell you, it won't always pay off, but it's worth a shot and you'll learn something from doing it. So PubMed is interesting. Of course, you can read different medical journals, take a glance at them through your library, you know, like the Journal of the American Medical Association. One professor at our dental school says, read the opinion articles because you'll find out what people think. What about K Katie, any, you have any particular thoughts yeah, so actually one of the things that I was thinking about in our, in our conversation 
Um, at the Career Center, I obviously review a lot of resumes. And of course, a lot of the pre-med students, um, when helping with the bullet points, they say, oh, well, this is just one of those resume builders that I wanted to put on because I know it's good for med school. And that's one of the things that I really want students to be able to stay away from, you know, especially when applying to things when it comes to ex experiential opportunities, like, oh, you know, I think this is a good for my med school application, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, when it comes to that, you want to make sure that you, you're going to come off genuine because again, in interviews, when they're going to ask you about, you know, what experiences you've did, if they see you've done research, you also don't want to feel like you've been a fly in the wall in those type, you know, whether it's shadow, shadowing or volunteering, you want to make the most out of your experiences that way. And especially, you know, right now, uh, how can you stand out in your application is by, you know, that non-traditional path sometimes can really help, but also exploring. So, um, you know, get to know, use the resources, use the tools. Um, as Jim has mentioned, you know, using um, some of those online resources, it's gonna really help. There's also podcasts that you can listen to that I know a lot of also pre-med students use to talk about MCAT prep, or also even talking about interviewing prep. With the MMIs, it's really important, you know, practice those questions, as well as maybe practicing. You can practice with a peer, but also maybe having someone do those, you know, um, that mock interview. What does it feel like to uh, talk about your experiences, but what's that medical school interview going to feel like too? So definitely, you know, gaining experience is important, but, you know, making sure it's just like that marriage when applying to medical school, same thing with your application. You want to make sure your experiences are unique to yourself. Yep. And one thing here, this is uh, obviously going to be different, I'm sure, in the age of coronavirus, but um, one thing to keep in mind, this is a resource that's been at Stony Brook and it's probably, it, I imagine it's going to be virtual and probably Christian knows more about this than I do, but grand rounds. Different medical schools have things called grand rounds that are lectures that typically were open to the public. Keep an eye on, they might be, these, these things might be virtual, but it's an opportunity to hear a lecture about a medical topic. I am aware that grand rounds are a thing. I'm not sure how they're being done now. I would assume virtually. I'm not sure how to become part of them from the public unless you already know um, somebody that's part of that session that can send you the link. Okay. Um, but I do know from before with grand rounds, you were able to go in and see what's going on, learn about cases, learn about how physicians are thinking about um, approaching certain cases, very unique ones. Um, and often uh, there are like, medical students there that are presenting and trying to learn the craft, learn the profession. And you also get an insight into see how they're sort of progressing, which is a, a unique perspective to get. Okay, Grant, let's see what else. Okay. So again, so all these programs, PA, PT, MD, DDS, so those you need to apply to. You can major in anything. There's a set of basic prerequisites to do, um, you know, with labs. AP credit, AP credit in a lot of cases counts. Don't rely on English AP credit. But one thing is you don't want all of your prerequisites by any means to be just AP credit. One thing also, and I think Katie and I guess Christian, you maybe you agree with this too, is I believe it's the case. Medical schools and dental schools connect the dots. Meaning if we have a student who has a C in biochemistry and then the student gets a low biochem score on the MCAT, that's problems. On the other hand, if the person had a C in biochemistry and then gets a super score on the biochemical foundation section, a medical school might be more inclined to say, he, this student obviously knows what he, knows what she's doing. Let's give him a break call them in for an interview. So it's, uh, I often say that getting into medical school is like getting through customs. If they spot, if they spot the whiff of a decaying orange in your luggage, they're gonna tear everything apart. If everything is okay, then you won't have as many problems. But still, if you really want to do this, I think you'll be able to do it. Okay. All right, scholars for medicine. Well, I don't know. Um, 
the admissions people know. Are we, we're, are we going over time-wise? Did we cover everything? How are you guys doing? Jim, yeah, you covered everything. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for, you know, coming in and, uh, and being with us today, especially, uh, um, you know, our, uh, you know, our guests, uh, Jim and Katie and, and Christian, um, and, plus, and Professor Flesher. Um, it's just, it's a nice, uh, it's just nice to talk about uh, some of the things I think that students don't normally think of in terms of medical school. Um, they're always worried about the grades, they're worried about the courses, what kind of courses, but they don't think overall um, in the broader spectrum of, of what it is to become a physician. And now the, the stakes are higher because it's, it's um, probably more competitive than it ever has been. So now you have to make yourself more marketable. I think these are all real great examples. Um, if any students, if you have any questions, um, you can always feel free to email us at enroll, E-N-R-O-L-L, -L, at stonybrook.edu. If you have any questions um, regarding uh, admissions for Stony Brook, um, or if any questions about today, um, you can certainly uh, email us. I want to thank everybody for, you know, joining us and uh, again, thanking our guests. Um, I hope can I you all- one final, Could I ask one final question? Sure. Okay. Um, this could be advice for someone. I want to ask Katie, how do you manage to be so flawlessly polite and upbeat all the time? <laughs> it just comes genuinely. Ah. <laughs> it does. And I you know, it, a secret. events like this, I just, I, it, it's amazing to talk about it. This is my favorite topic, you know, talking about, you know, what can students do? And, and that's why Jim, it just comes naturally. <laughs> Future admissions Dean. Ah, thank you. I'm telling you, Katie Zeitz. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, check out Stony Brook, check out other schools. Uh, one admission, to, as long as I'm talking about admissions, Dean, Rutgers Newark, Dr. George Heinrich, their admissions office. Very, very, very nice people. If you reach out to Dr. Heinrich at Rutgers or Mercedes Rivero, tell them that Jim Montren said, I should get in touch with your school because you're so wonderful. They're really nice people. One thing about this, and this is the last thing I know I'm taking up too much of your time, is you will find that there are some people in, in medical schools like Christian, but also in medical school admissions and on the faculty who really care about what they do a lot. Ditto with dental schools, nursing, PT. And it, it's a privilege to work with these people. And also it's a privilege to work with students. That's why even though this is virtual, it's been very, very nice to talk to you. And one day perhaps, you will be a professor at Stony Brook and will be on the pre-med committee where I will recruit you after you come here, you know, and you get into Stony Brook's med school and, and then you'll be taught by Professor Christian Rodriguez and, uh, and you'll be interviewed by Dean Katie Zeiss. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot and take Thank care. You. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.